tonight, we'll explain all the amendments on the ballot and drill into the debate over medical marijuana. Plus, we have some tightening in the polls and more changes in the presidential race from the Battle of Florida to the new fight for Texas. This is Money, Power and Politics. Oh, let's start with a scorecard. Fox News projections show Donald Trump is in a hole because if Hillary Clinton wins the states that Fox News has rated as solid or leaning Democrat, she will have at least 307 electoral votes and you only need 270 to win. Fox has 57 votes in the toss up column and the decision team moved Iowa from leaning Trump to toss up. Meanwhile, projections show Democrats will gain some seats in the House, but not enough to take over the chamber. Different story, though, in the United States Senate. Democrats have a good chance to take over that chamber, but it may be very close one way or the other. And it all could come down to Florida, where Senate Democrats pulled their money from Patrick Murphy. Our Fox 13 poll shows Murphy is tied with Marco Rubio, but the Democrats decided it's expensive to advertise in Florida, and there are other states where they have an equal, maybe, or better chance to gain seats. So they kind of left Patrick Murphy standing at the altar. Murphy was a Republican who supported Mitt Romney, and Rubio is a household name across the state, and has held a slight lead in most of the polls going back months. That may have played into some of their thinking. Well, we're updating the forecast every night from here through election night. We're also fact checking the ads and explaining the issues, and we've received a lot of questions about the amendments and requests to break them down. So that's our next step here tonight. We'll go through all of the amendments on the ballot, what they would change, and the pros and cons. We'll start with the one that's getting much of the attention. That's Amendment 2 for medical marijuana and some questions for the opposition. It's a fraud, folks. And anybody that thinks it's anything other than that, smoking marijuana. The push for medical marijuana failed in 2014, but this year, medical marijuana is back on the ballot with Amendment 2. Supporters say marijuana for medical use will help people suffering from severe pain and debilitating disease. Opponents say the amendment is vague and susceptible to abuse. We'll cover both sides as the debate plays out, and tonight we'll hear from Dr. Jessica Spencer, who speaks for the opposition. And so please welcome Dr. Spencer. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. So the core of your argument is that this amendment would be susceptible or open to abuse, correct? Absolutely. We're essentially looking at the same amendment that we saw in 2014. If it was a closed list, if there were only specific conditions listed, say cancer, AIDS, glaucoma, period, at that point, would you be open to supporting this amendment? I think the problem with that is, is that's not what we're looking at. It's so not, it but, does, it, but if it, it was. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter what would be or what could be. That's not what is. What is is what we're looking at and how they worded it, how they phrased it, and what they're putting forth as a constitutional amendment, which would supersede all state and local. There's no local control over this. We're looking at the same thing we saw in 2014. Well, I'm asking because I'm trying to get a sense of the objection that you have only being the fact that it's an open-ended list. So were they to have closed it? That's why I'm asking. I wish that was you, my only objection. <laughs> that, that's where I'm going. Your other objection would be? There's numerous problems with this amendment. Not only is it loophole written again, it does open it up for any condition, much like we see in the California style amendment. What people do not understand is this is not pharmacy. This is bud tenders. These are not pharmacists that are trained. So you're not going to your local pharmacy to pick up, quote, medicine, because this is not medicine. You are going to need to look in um, California and what we're seeing either by going on Google or wherever to find medical marijuana dispensaries to see what we're actually going to be facing. The difficulty with the other conditions is that they've added conditions and then kept it wide open so that it will be abused. If it was not wide open, if it was closed, would that be a different conversation in your mind? Would you be open to supporting it? Oh, I would not be open to supporting it. I'm, I support scientific study. I support true medicine through the FDA process. That is not what this is, no matter if you closed it or left it with one condition listed on there, period. If this were to pass, would violent crime go up? It could, certainly. That's what we're experiencing in the other states, absolutely. You're dealing with a cash business and you're dealing with criminal entities. Well, now, I have seen studies, including one from UT Dallas, that showed in the 11 states that passed medical marijuana from 90 to 2006, you saw a drop in violent crime. I would argue that that's incorrect, and I would go through the law enforcement municipalities, and I would actually also look at the different laws that were in place in those states. That is not what we're looking at here in the state of Florida with this constitutional amendment. What are the health risks of marijuana? There's many. Marijuana affects the brain directly. 
there are obvious impairments to when you're breathing things in. The only thing we're supposed to breathe in is oxygen, not smoke. Um, the list can go on and on. To those who look at what appear to be contradictions in drug policy, for example, you have people in Florida receiving joints courtesy of Uncle Sam, our federal government, free of charge for decades because they have glaucoma or a bone tumor disorder, and others who are saying, wait a minute, I have a debilitating medical condition as well, and I can't get this, you would say what? First, to the individuals that were in that IND study, the only reason why they're getting that continued from the University of Mississippi is because they went through a legal case to get that. That was a failed study. That's a moot point. The individuals that claim that they have a debilitating condition and they can't get that now, in fact, two days ago, the email that United for Care sent out from John Morgan says, if they rescheduled, this would still be illegal. No, it wouldn't. We have three laws on the books here, primarily Florida Statute 893 that's been around for decades, that allows people to have marijuana under medical conditions through their doctor. But again, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a flawed amendment a loophole written amendment that's going to be on our ballot that once you change your Florida Constitution it is extremely difficult to take it back. But it can be done. It's been done before. In the United States you've had an 18th and 21st Amendment. You've had bullet trains here in Florida. It's not impossible but if it doesn't work. But let's be serious. We already know how much money it costs to put something like this on the ballot and to get those signatures. That's incredibly difficult to do. So what will the fallout be in the meantime if that happens? But it won't happen because, again, Floridians are way too smart for this. They can see that this is the same amendment, essentially, that we saw two years ago, and they're not going to vote for it. If you're concerned that it's susceptible to abuse, why not rely on law enforcement to snuff out the bad apples so that this can be implemented with very little abuse? Because, unfortunately, you have now you've opened the gates to the Wild West with the language the way this amendment is written. You've actually created more difficulty for law enforcement and the Department of Health and our physicians and our, our local people to handle the problems that will come inevitably from this amendment. Dr. Spencer, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you. This is a copy of a ballot that was received by a gentleman in plantation. It's uh, deficient because if you go to the section that has the constitutional amendments, it does not list amendment two. That's right. We have controversy in Southeast Florida because some voters in Broward County say there was some sort of glitch because amendment two did not show up on their ballots. We're simply asking that as the ballots are opened up by mail, that amendment two was in fact on it. Well, election managers say this was a goof that only affected a handful of ballots and the judge is looking into it. This is something that could come back around if the results are close. On amendment, you need more than a majority. You need 60% in order to pass. Coming up, controversy over Amendment 1 and how it would affect solar energy. It sounds good. It sounds like it would advance solar, but it's not true at all. We'll show both sides, explain the other amendments, and take you inside the battle for the White House. Well, we have some interesting amendments on the ballot this year, and many of you have asked us to explain Amendment 1. And that one could have a big impact on energy here in Florida, for better or worse, depending on who you ask. It relates to solar energy and whether solar producers can compete with the power companies. Well, Florida utility companies are backing Amendment 1 on the claim that it would protect their consumers and control costs for people who do not go solar. Well, critics say it'll make it harder to compete with the power monopolies and would therefore impede or slow the growth of solar energy in Florida. So we're going to drill into this one, starting with some background from Anjali Davis. Supporters claim it's the obvious future for powering up Florida, but a new amendment tapping into solar power in Florida is leaving many seeing red. The way the initiative is written is it sounds good. It sounds like it would advance solar, but it's not true at all. Susan Glickman of Southern Alliance for Clean Energy says Amendment 1, which promises to protect consumers and businesses in the state's initiative towards solar power, is flawed. Current law already allows you to own or lease solar panels, so we have that right. Critics of Amendment 1, like Lickman, say the ballot measure is backed by the state's big utility companies as a way to make solar energy more restricted and highly regulated. Supporters of the amendment disagree. All we're doing is codifying in the Constitution 
the current situation. Voters in favor of Amendment 1 say it encourages the use of solar power, but helps protect consumers from fraud and makes the playing field fair for all energy customers. If all of a sudden you're going to create a situation of haves and have-nots, this particular energy is not regulated. Well, this one is very much regulated. And you're going to get to a situation where you have to raise rates on people who can least afford it. That's not a good business model. It doesn't make sense for consumers and it doesn't make sense for utilities. Still, critics say the measure would mean turning the lights out on solar in Florida. What it's intended to do is to make it harder for people, families and businesses to get solar on your roof. So again, bottom line, this amendment does two things. One, it gives consumers a constitutional right to produce solar energy for personal use. We already have that right under the law, but this stamps it into the Constitution. And two, it gives government a constitutional right to regulate it and restrict competition with the utilities. So a yes on one would make it harder for people or third parties to sell their energy on the open market. They could be hit with new regulations and fees, for example, and that could in fact limit the growth of solar energy. On the other hand, utilities say it would help people who do not invest in solar panels because they would not have to subsidize those who do by paying extra to maintain the grid. And that's Amendment 1. In the first half of our show, we walked you through Segment 2 on medical marijuana. And that brings us now to Amendment 3. The legislature put this one on the ballot. It would give some tax relief to permanently disabled first responders. If passed, if first responders are injured in the line of duty and become permanently disabled, they could get property tax exemptions. So the pro on this one is that it would help people who suffered serious disabilities by putting their lives on the line for all of us. It would also reduce the amount of taxes they pay and as for the con, it would reduce the amount of money our government takes in to provide services for all of us. So that's the back and forth on Amendment 3. As for Amendment 4, there is no Amendment 4 in November. The ballot skips ahead to Amendment 5 because Amendment 4 was on the primary ballot back in August. It gave tax breaks for investments in solar, and that one already passed. So yes, that brings us now to Amendment 5, also placed on the ballot by our legislature. This one would give more property tax relief to many but not all senior citizens. In short, if senior citizens' homes are valued at less than $250,000, they would qualify for a new tax break. And so would permanently disabled veterans over the age of 65 and spouses of veterans and first responders who died while serving. On one hand, it gives tax relief to a lot of senior citizens. On the other, the government would not bring in as much money, therefore, and could shift the tax burden to others. Now to recap all of this, we mapped out the amendments and much more on the ballot on our YouTube channel. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power and Politics and click subscribe at the top of the page. You'll also find our fact checks, investigations, money and politics, our humor segments and prior shows you may have missed. Now let's move on to the changes in the presidential race because Trump is behind in most of the polls, but he's closing the gap in our latest Fox poll. The firestorm over his remarks about groping women 10 years ago have settled down and more Republicans are coming off the fence and lining up for Donald Trump. Dr. Larry Sabato saw it coming. There's no question that there's a little tightening based on the fact that some Republican partisans are finally coming to Trump. Not all of them. There are a lot of never Trumps. And those never Trumps could burn Trump in states you may not expect like Utah and Texas. Coming up, Texas hasn't voted for a Democrat in 40 years. Could Clinton really win this one? We'll show you the odds and take a closer look at the early vote in Florida and the clues it may reveal about how it all plays out. Well, in 2012, Mitt Romney won Texas by 16 points, but this year the anti-Trump Republicans and Latino voters for Hillary Clinton could burn Donald Trump. So Casey Stiegel shows us how the fight for Texas is playing out. In a year of political firsts, add this to the list. For the first time since 1976, Texas is a toss-up state. A recent poll conducted by the University of Houston shows just a three-point margin between Trump and Secretary Hillary Clinton. Plus, the real clear state average has Trump up just six points. Significant, explains Cal Gilson, a political science professor at Southern Methodist University, because Republican presidential candidates usually enjoy double-digit leads and wins here. That means a lot of Republicans are uncomfortable, they're dumbfounded, they're deeply concerned. And early clues from early voting gives Democrats even more reason to be optimistic. 
A line spilling out the door at an early voting location in Harris County near Houston. This is a little unusual. Four years ago, President Obama narrowly won this slice of Texas, and voter turnout was among the highest in history. This time around, new records have already been shattered. In the first full day of early voting in Harris County, more than 67,000 people cast a ballot, roughly 20,000 more than day one in 2012. In Dallas, different county, same story. An 80% hike has been recorded with first day voting totals. In and around Austin, almost a 100% jump. Jilson adds many establishment Texas Republicans just can't get behind this GOP nominee. There's real reluctance, and some of that reluctance will show itself in people staying home, leaving the top of the ticket blank. State Democrats see this as a golden opportunity. Being this close is a huge accomplishment for, for this party. Um, and it is getting people excited because, you know, in a state like this that always has traditionally gone Republican. Well, the first couple of days of early voting in Texas show a spike in ballots from Democratic precincts. But all of that said, Trump is still up in Texas in an average of polls. And while it may be closer than usual, Hillary Clinton is still a long shot in the state of Texas. Coming up, we'll show you who has the edge in early voting here in Florida. And the White House is driving more big changes in our relationship with Cuba. Okay, we have some more interesting changes in the United States relationship with Cuba. The United Nations time and time again has voted against our trade embargo against Cuba, in effect condemning our embargo. And time after time, our nation has stood up to it in the United Nations, but not this time around. This time the White House directed our government to abstain from that particular vote, saying we're not going to stand up to the United Nations on this one. It is a strong signal to Congress from the White House to try to get Congress to lift the trade embargo against Cuba, but this ultimately will come down to the position of the next president and the next Congress. One of many reasons why this election is very important, has big implications. And with that in mind, I want to take a look now at the early vote in Florida because it is fascinating. Bottom line, Florida is going to be close. If you look at the early voting numbers, there is good news in this both for Republicans and Democrats. First off, two and a half million people have already voted more than that. That's nearly one in five of all Florida voters have already weighed in. Bet that more than 40% of the vote will be in before Election Day. Republicans are doing particularly well with strong turnout in the Fort Myers area. Democrats doing particularly well in their stronghold of Miami-Dade, but not as much so in Broward County. And with this, we'll continue to watch the returns as they come in the coming days, as it will give us some very good clues of which way Florida may go. Right now, it shows that our state may be a nail biter. That's our show tonight. We will see you again tomorrow night. Till then, take care.